in John chapter number 3. As you find in John chapter number 3, uh, how is the sound? Is it too much? We need a little bit more. It's okay. So in John chapter number 3, we're seeing that he must increase and I must decrease. And in the light of this verse, John gives a little bit of an explanation. While you're finding John chapter number 3, we were up on the uh, mountain there at Catterskill Falls. And uh, the water was particularly cold. I would say the water was actually in the 60s, probably in the low 60s. Uh, my wife asked, Is it, was it as cold as Iceland? I said, no. Last summer at this time, I took a dip in Iceland. And I, I was out there for a good 20-something minutes. It's in Iceland, wasn't it? Maybe more. But uh, the water there was a balmy 51 degrees in the, in the Arctic. Because it was summertime, so it was up to 51 degrees in the Arctic Ocean. And I, I went out there to out biking the Vikings and had a blast. That was uh, on my bucket list to swim in the Arctic. And uh, to go to Iceland and do a few things. And, and I had an opportunity to remember it because that was just uh, a year ago this week. And what a blast we had. My wife and I saw some amazing things. It really was a wonderful time in our life. And then this year we got to go to Catterskill, Catterskill Falls for a lot less money and because uh, it's free all you got to do is get there and uh, part of the state park your, your tax dollars already pay for it so you might as well enjoy those state parks because it's coming out of your check anyway and we uh, hiked even on my bad knee hiked up there and got under the falls and my wife got a picture of the falls coming down on me get that shower and jumped into the pool the pool uh, goes from anywhere from about one foot deep to about six and a half feet deep in the center it's not very big but there were plenty of people there and there in the pool dove in and it had to be in the 60s I would say probably somewhere between 62, 63, maybe 64 degrees the water, the water was and uh, you know you saw some of the young men, the, the, the Mexican kids that had come, uh, they, 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 they manned up and they dove in but there was a couple of these <coughs> British kids that had come and uh, I couldn't believe they British kids sitting up there and they, they, they got in the water and they're dipping in and they're oh my goodness and they're just tipping toe and, and never fully committed. I said what's wrong with these kids? I mean aren't these the descendants of the Battle of the Light Brigade? I said you got these two kids and then they're there with their girlfriends so clearly they're probably living in sin but they're they're there and uh, they never get more than waist deep in the water and so I finally I, I told the, the, the light skin kid I said look I said it's just like marriage at some point you just got to take the leap and jump in and he almost got the nerve I almost guilted him into it and it looked like he said, dipped in a little more and, nope nope turn around walk away <laughs> Well, his girlfriend heard that too, so I, I hope she saw that and said, hey, mental note, this kid is afraid of commitment. <laughs> Wouldn't get his hair wet. And I tell you, when you get into marriage, when you decide to get married, you're going to get your hair wet. And uh, it's a, it's a full-on baptismal experience in life and, and his friend which was no better just a, a white kid from Britain and he wouldn't get in either I said are you going to go into the falls oh yeah I plan to do it the whole time they never did it I, I was there in the water about 40 minutes or so and uh, splashing around having a good time the, the young Mexican kids I mean they're from a tropical climate they jumped in I mean not for long don't get me wrong <laughs> but they had the guts to do it they did it once amen I says I can ex I can respect that I can respect that. A little Guatemalan girl, she, she climbed up there and she, she was only about this high. She's a full grown woman and she was only about this high. She was shorter than Jenny. And uh, she, she followed me up. I was under the waterfall. She followed me up under the waterfall. She says, if that old white guy can do it, I can do it too. And uh, she fall, found her way under the, 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 the pouring of the waterfall. And it took her about two seconds to decide, nope, this is too hard. I did it. I'm out of here. And she starts climbing back out. I said, but she did it. She had the guts. She did it. And here this kid was, clearly in his late 20s, and he just wouldn't commit. Wasn't going to get his hair wet. They stood there, and they hesitated, and they hesitated, and they hesitated. Oh, isn't that a, a picture of, uh, of a lot of folks in this new generation? They, they, they hesitate, hesitate, hesitate on marriage. And they're, they're afraid to, to get all in. So, but, you know, sometimes you gotta you got to do it. The Bible says in... Hebrews chapter number 13, verse number 4. Marriage is honorable in all. And the marriage bed undefiled. It's an honorable thing that the marriage bed be undefiled. And uh, it is God's will for, for a man and a woman, uh, for almost all men and women, to, to find a, a, a mate and to marry. Uh, it's a normal course. It's a normal course of humanity. In fact, it's possible, but it's the exception. 
when a man and woman uh, remain unmarried. And according to the scripture, the purpose of that should be so that a man or a woman should commit themselves full time to the service of God and that the conditions of that service, the conditions of that service warrant that they don't marry because there's going to be too many temptations or too much trouble, difficulty uh, in the way, like the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul says uh, that he had the right to lead around. He and Barnabas had the right to lead around a wife. But he makes a little comment, like the other apostles. You know that Peter was married? The Apostle Peter was married. I mean, the Catholics try to t take him and, and assume that he's the first Pope of the Bishop or Bishop of Rome. They call him Pope, but uh, Pope means father, and the Bible says call no man father on the earth, especially in the religious context. Uh, and don't call anybody rabbi, because Messiah is our rabbi, and God is our father. But he was married. In fact, the Bible says Jesus healed his mother-in-law. A blessing I'm sure he did not ask for. He almost got that problem taken care of and Jesus came along and healed her. <laughs> no, Peter, you're going to have to learn suffering. You're going to write a passage on it one day. <laughs> so he saved his mother-in-law. So you only have a mother-in-law when you're married. But Paul specifically says, like Cephas, like Peter, married like Peter. He says, we do. But because of the current conditions, because of the fact that his life and lifestyle was so fraught with danger, and the fact that he spent the better part of his adult life after Christ in and out of prisons being beaten and unjustly interrogated, uh, he would not be able to fulfill his responsibilities as a husband to a woman that he would be tempted to, to not be able to pursue God's will for his life in the, the evangelistic journeys that was laid out for him, the course that God had set out for the Apostle Paul. He said there's no sin in that, it's just God's will for his particular life was different, that he should remain unmarried. But he makes it clear that the normal course of things is that a man or a woman should marry. That's important. What we see here in John chapter number 3 that John the Baptist makes a an analogy of his position to Christ. And he says in verse number 27, a man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Well, I'd like to think that your wife, amen, is given to you from heaven. And if you prayed about it, it's true, she is. That's just a side application, not the direct uh, interpretation. Ye yourselves, verse 28, bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ. But I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which is the best man, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This, my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. Oh, Heavenly Father, in the few moments that we have here this morning, we pray that you would give me the grace and the unction to expound on this passage of Scripture as well as on uh, the topic du jour, Father. We pray that your Holy Spirit would apply it to each and every one of us uh, as is appropriate, Father, as we are thinking about a marriage that we already have, uh, the influence of the, the, those that are being married or soon and those who are looking for a mate. Uh, Heavenly Father, you might be honored in all things in that uh, even the marriages that you ordain for us in our lives, Lord, could be constructed and founded upon thee. Father, we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so weddings and marriages are a little bit different, right? There's a big difference between a wedding and a marriage. Wedding happens in a moment. In fact, in the state of New York, as it is in many states, uh, for me, as a ordained pastor, of course, and a licensed minister in the state of New York, if you wanted to get married, we could do it in literally 30 seconds. The only thing that's required is you have to have a witness and me to say, do you receive him and do you receive her as your lawfully wedded husband or wife? All the other things that we say in a marriage ceremony are for the church and for God. All the other oaths are honoring before the church and God. 
for the state of New York, they only have to have a witness that you say, I want to be married, and she says, I want to be married, and the minister marries you, announces you married. About 30 seconds is all it takes and two signatures uh, from each of you, one from me, and two from the witnesses. And you're legally married in the state of New York. That's it. Nothing else has to be said. Can happen in a moment. Well, the religious ceremony, of course, happens a little bit more detailed, right? Thank God you're Baptists. <laughs> Most of you, right? Because how many of you ever been to a Catholic or an Orthodox wedding? Holy cow. <laughs> Get me out of here. What a miserable experience that is. The only thing keeps you going is the thought that there might be food. <laughs> and if they're too cheap to buy dinner... <laughs> You might be too cheap to buy car fare to get there. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's rough. Baptist weddings, I'll be honest, for, for as long as a Baptist sermon is on a Sunday morning, right? Because we're, we're famous. But at the same time, if you get an interesting preacher, it, it's not bad. In any sermon that is boring, even a 20-minute sermon that's boring sounds like an hour. It feels like an hour. A sermon that's interesting and engaging and it's an hour long feels like 20 minutes. And uh, I've been in a lot of formal churches and state churches of Europe and, and i got to tell you, even 15 minutes, you're like, oh, oh, oh. And I've heard some big heads, even amongst ourselves, even in Baptist churches, they come out of Bible college with three degrees and uh, they, they don't know how to preach, they don't know how to use any illustrations and they're just boring. I mean, they're like watching paint dry and 15, 20 minutes into it, you're like, oh God, please send a bead to sting this minister so that something exciting will happen this morning. Well, a lot of weddings are just like that. You're just waiting for somebody to trip. You know that the trip on the gown, that the flower girl trips and her roses fall over the place, that they lose the ring, because at least that's interesting, right? <laughs> oh, my. The Baptist weddings, they're short. Soup to nuts. I've never been in one that's more than 30. Well, that's not true. There was one. <laughs> by a local, a local uh, young man who was an assistant pastor at a church and they had like three or four ministers oh my goodness that was a long wedding but that's not typical most Baptist weddings soup to nuts you're in you're out the vows are exchanged everything 20 to 30 minutes you are done and then it's time to eat <laughs> that's one Baptist vice that we can all agree on but sin of gluttony that's, that's one of those minor sins in the Baptist faith but uh, weddings are a celebratory time. It happens in a moment. But of course, a marriage is something that lasts a lifetime, it's supposed to last a lifetime. Something that you work on forever. You work and prepare for a wedding. It can be elaborate, it can be simple, it can, it can require a good deal of effort and money and wedding planners, or it can be just very nonchalant and easy. Be in the church, it can be in your, your living room, uh, it can be at a destination. All depending on there's some level of planning, some level of work and effort to make it happen. Once it's happened, the wedding has happened. But a marriage, well, a marriage requires work from that day through the rest of your life. Where you have to work on yourself and you have to work on your love and commitment and following through on your vows with that individual. That's a pretty big challenge. <clears throat> Bible says that you and I... As members of the, the, the mystical body of Christ, as, as members of the church, the eternal church and local church, we are the bride of Christ. Not merely as individuals, but the church, we're bride of Christ. The apostle, or the, 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 the John the Baptist here is speaking about Christ in that sense, that he is a bridegroom. And that John the Baptist is his best man, that this is his joy, is to prepare the way for, for the wedding feast and the marriage, the union of Christ and his bride. And he says this is a beautiful thing. He says all this preparation was for him. John the Baptist came before the face of the Lord. His job was to prepare the wedding. God had prepared the entrance of the Messiah to prepare the wedding. And here the bridegroom was coming. And Jesus must increase. And I must decrease. Now in the ancient days, the bridegroom or the friend of the, 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 the bridegroom, he did a lot of work behind the scenes. 
everybody did a lot of work but the the best man he didn't just show up today in our modern world the best man's job is one thing who knows what that one thing is well technically two things he's to hold the ring and do what make sure the groom shows up <laughs> That's his job. All right, buddy. <laughs> 10 o'clock. Don't care what shape you're in. Don't care about your crying. Don't care about your doubts. <laughs> it's my job to encourage you, give you that pep talk, and to drag your rear end all the way to the altar. <laughs> in the ancient days, weddings were quite elaborate. In Jesus' day, a wedding could go for a couple days if the family was poor to a couple weeks if the family was prominent, wealthy. There was a lot of preparation. When they killed an animal, they had to feed hundreds of people. The village was expected. They didn't have small family weddings. It was a major event in the life of a family. It was a community event that brought together the community and unified and brought identity to a people. It was more than just the bride and the groom. It was the coming together of families, together a town. It was a celebration of life and love and an acknowledgement that these two people now belong to one another and were unioned with one another. You know, Jesus' parents, there's no indication in the scripture his parents ever got that. Uh, that's profound if you really let, sit and think about it. I mean, Jesus, his mother was pregnant <laughs> But not with her betrothed, her fiancé's baby. And Joseph, being a good man, was not going to embarrass her publicly. And when the Holy Spirit came, an angel said, Joseph, that which is inside of her is holy. It is a God thing. Take her to your wife. I have chosen you to protect my son. I mean, you can imagine that vision. You, you might have thought, well, what did I have for dinner last night? And Joseph took it seriously. He was a righteous man that God could trust. And he took a woman with somebody else's baby, somebody else's child, and raised it as his own. He adopted Jesus. All the rest of the kids were his. He adopted Jesus. Raised him as his own, loved him as his own, protected him as if he was on a mission from God. Because he knew in his heart that it was God's will for him to marry that woman. And that meant all that that came with. Her baggage. Now, I gotta imagine that, oh, Jesus wasn't a problem. No, it, it, I can't imagine Jesus was much of a problem child. Probably wasn't much of a problem, but you know how much of a problem child it is to, to, to be the overseer of, of the woman and the child who is the, the, the son of God? Satan always trying to kill him. I mean, for crying out loud, they ended up having to leave in the middle of the night. <laughs> they escaped without a good wedding. There's no indication in the Bible that they ever had a public ceremony. It just all kind of got brushed under the rug silently and a few years later he just returns with, with his wife and a small child and God only knows maybe a couple others that he had in Egypt. <laughs> he takes her down to Bethlehem and nobody done, done, done wiser. And the Bible says you don't know her, don't mess with her, don't touch her physically, don't union with her until after this baby is born. And Joseph was a man of that kind of self-control because remember, she was found with child, so somewhere around three months, he's taking her as his own and he's got to sit around and wait for a while, you know? He's demonstrating self-control. And waits till after the child is born, after all the ceremonial purification and cleansing is done, before he is unioned with his wife, and they they have a marriage before God, a marriage union before God. After the baby is born, and after she goes through her purifications and makes her offerings, and the child is circumcised, and, and her healing is done from after having the children, because in the Bible you're not allowed to touch a woman until a certain amount of time after the child is born, for the sake of her body healing especially in a day when medicine was so sparse. The Bible made protections for women uh, from the cravings of men. 
And Joseph, as a true gentleman, demonstrated immense self-control. But there was a point in time when he was released and allowed to take his wife as his own. And he had brothers and sisters. Jesus had brothers and sisters, half-brothers and sisters through Joseph. But can you imagine the danger? This man took a woman whose child the king of his country wanted to execute. <laughs> and if he had to go through Joseph to do it, that was not going to be a problem. And Joseph's one job from God was to protect these people. And to be an honorable man and to supply. And he did. He was a hard-working man with a good work ethic and a solid attitude. A man who accepted what God wanted for his life and accepted this woman and her child as his own. And there's every indication that he lived honorably and executed his duties after that until somewhere between that early birth narrative and the time that Jesus was presented, Joseph somewhere, somewhere just uh, dies. He comes off the scene. It appears he's dead. That's the, the, the reasonable assumption we all have. His, his parents never got that wedding ceremony. At the same time, Christ, of course, never married in the flesh, right? Never married a woman. Was chased. John the Baptist also seems to have never married a woman. There is no indication that he ever married. That he remained chaste in his life and demonstrating self-control. Even wielding authority over people and never taking advantage of it. But he understood the dynamics. They understood the family dynamics, the cultural dynamics of this whole thing. And he says, Jesus is the groom and I am his best man. And I've been preparing the way for the groom to have his union with his bride. There is a very big and special event, a, a, a wedding coming. And the Bible uses these type of analogies. It uses this kind of... Uh, illustrative uh, verses and passages uh, throughout scripture to demonstrate the nature of our relationship with God that God desires a personal relationship with you that is is more than just a servant and master and make no mistake about the dynamic here God is the master he is Lord. He is authoritative. And authority, he is the authority in our lives. There's, there's no doubt about that. And we must submit to that. Joseph in his life had. John had. Jesus. Perfect submission throughout his whole life. Jesus also calls his disciples friends. Given us the connotation that there is a special union, a closeness that he desires in this relationship. But the Bible says even further that we who are believers, who are born again by the power of God, by the seed of the word of God, we are resurrected and made new lives. That is so that you should have a unique and special relationship with God, a union with God. That is unique. In the Old Testament, the Bible speaks through several Old Testament passages about this concept. And we don't have time to go through all the passages, but you want to look them up. Isaiah 62 5, Isaiah 54 5, Jeremiah 2 2, and of course, Hosea is a prophet who absolutely demonstrates to the world about God's desire. To, 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 to bring to himself a bride, a, a unique and special relationship of love and unity. One of oneness. And so in Hosea chapter 2, verses uh, 16 through 23, it demonstrates it. You want to go back and read that later. But the whole thing about Hosea the prophet is, is, is about a, a faithful man of God who is standing in the stead or in the place of God as an illustrative picture. And he is married to a woman who had a lo loose lifestyle before she met him. Uh, let's just say she, 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 she was a streetwalker. She was a prostitute for all intents and purposes. She had been passed around like... Oh, she had been passed around. <laughs> And God told him to marry this woman. And you got to imagine that this older, mature man of God says, Really? 
God, really? He says, go and marry this woman, a woman who is unfaithful, a woman who's going to cheat on you, a woman you can't trust. Uh, well, God can trust Hosea because Hosea was a man of God. And he demonstrated to Israel that they are continually disobedient, continually uh, uh, walking away and, and adulterating their relationship with God and going after other gods. That they were not pursuing and working on that relationship before God. And Hosea worked through the course of the bumps and bruises of their marriage uh, with this young woman. It started with a commitment, I I'm going to be only for you and you're going to be only for me. And Hosea never fails that. But that woman, oh man. You know, her first child. Hosea says, you're, we're going to name your first child. Your first child is not my child. That's the name, Loami. Not mine. Not my child. Right away, she's having babies with other people running around on them. And it demonstrated the love of God because God was constantly reaching out to His bride. And even today in our church, in our churches, in your relationship, you've got to wonder how many times are we unfaithful to God? How many times do we drop the ball and disappoint Him? How many times do we pursue other gods and interests that he, he doesn't want us to pursue that we think are so important in this world that we're kind of cheating on God? And then we go to him and beg him to take us back. Ask him to forgive us. And he does. <laughs> He's always faithful. See, our relationship as a church and as individuals, as members of the church, we, we are the bride of Christ. And our lives are to be purified. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 11, 2, the apostle says, I am trying to present you as a pure, chaste virgin to the Lord. Ephesians 5, verses 25 through 27 says, Husbands, love your wives according to the example that you find in Christ, right? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church and gave himself for her. Uh, that was a dynamic that turned the world upside down. Can you imagine? I, I know it's been a couple years since we mentioned it, but you realize that in the first century, love was not a requirement for marriage. <laughs> So, Pastor, that's just in the old-fashioned days. Okay, let me put it back into modern perspective. Do you realize that over half the marriages on earth, close to almost two-thirds of the marriages on earth, are not love marriages today? Oh, people just marrying for convenience. No, 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 they're, they're arranged marriages. The biggest part of the world lives in the 1040, uh, 10 degrees off of the equator, if we're, you know, The bulk of the world's population today still does not what have they, they call love marriages. The bulk of the world's population today has arranged marriage. The wife and the husband don't really choose each other. They're chosen for each other. So oh, that's old-fashioned. Most of the world still does it today. It's only in our Western cultures that love marriages and the, the, the cultures that have been influenced by the British Empire or what's left of the French or, or the Belgian type influences. It, it's only in those countries that had the, the colonization of, of Western Europe that this concept of love marriages exist. That's an outgrowth of Christianity. The Bible says husbands love your wives. In, in the first century, just as it is in many places, you can love your wife, you can not love your wife. That's, a, it's, that's something that's up to you. <laughs> But that wasn't a prerequisite for marriage. People didn't get divorced because they stopped loving each other. And much of the world, people didn't get married because they loved each other. They got married because they were told to marry each other. They were often engaged before they were even in puberty. Sometimes five, six, seven, eight, ten-year-old people were engaged, never met each other. Their families had exchanged uh, uh, commitments. And then they're introduced to each other. Even they go to college in America. They're from Pakistan. Young lady is college educated in America. She is put on a plane when she graduates and she finds herself in Lahore 
or Hyperbad, or one of the other little places where her family is from, and she meets her husband for the first time. Sometimes it's called the first look in the Indian culture. And then the first touch. Sometimes the first touch happens before the first look. You know, they just kind of, you know, try to make it romantic and stuff as they can. She's wearing a little outfit and stuff, and he's standing behind this side of the door. She's standing on that side of the door, and they reach around and touch each other's fingers on the other side of the door. They haven't even seen each other yet. Imagine his surprise. Holy cow. <laughs> Put that back in the package and send it back. <laughs> That's why they had the first touch before the first look. <laughs> it's the way of the world. Love isn't required in most of the marriages of the world. You can love, you're not married. The you know. purpose is to take care of each other and have children and virginity. Bring families together. If you love each other, well, that's good. Maybe that'll happen for you. Maybe it doesn't. We don't care. But uh, you realize that India, who has India and Pakistan, they have a very, very high level of arranged marriages. They have some of the lowest divorce rates on earth. Japan for a long time had arranged marriages and in it they had low divorce rate. Now Japan's a big mess today, don't, don't get me wrong, they're, they're, they're a huge mess, they're in big, big, big demographic trouble, <laughs> economic trouble as a consequence. But the Bible revolutionized the world when it said husbands love your wives. Wives. That, that was a, a political arrangement with understandings and details and, and contracts. and uh, Everybody had their role and a position to play, but love was not required in a marriage. And Jesus comes along in his spirit, and the Apostle Paul and the Apostles says, love your wives. Well, that's, that's a command to Christian people first and foremost, because most of the world didn't require love. In fact, it required love from Christians. It says, love your wife as Christ loves the church. Sacrificed himself for it. The Apostle Peter, who had been married, and we mentioned it earlier, he is the one that gives the instructions to New Testament Christian men. Husbands, consider your wives. Lest your prayers be hindered. Meaning... Christian men, God will hold you accountable for your relationship with your wife, and He will hold you accountable in your relationship to Him. God will judge between you and your wife, and if you're not honorable with your wife, men, then God will hinder your prayers. He'll throttle your blessings. He'll allow trips to come into your way. Until you straighten up. Because he's pretty uncompromising in this whole thing. Husbands love your wives. You know, that's an interesting thing because it is the natural inclination for women to love. Not all women. Now, let be honest, there's some psychopaths we have today. Some sociopaths that love themselves supremely. But for, for most women, the natural inclination is to love. They, they have a natural maternal instinct. They love their children. They, they have immense feelings. It's natural for a woman to love her husband more natural than a husband to love his wife. Or a, a husband, a man, has a tendency to, to, to accumulate things in their lives. You know, okay, I accumulate this, I got this, got this. All right, got my wife now, got my job now, got to have some kids, got to have a house, got to get the new car, got to get the better car. Men are designed to conquer and accumulate. That's our nature. And sometimes we forget that, that <laughs> when it comes to marriage, we have to put on the brakes there and realize that uh, just accumulating a wife and conquering a wife is not what God's intention is. It's not just one more thing to add to the list of things that we get. But that God has given you this woman for a purpose, that she is there to be a completer, not a competitor, but a completer. And not merely an accessory to your life. But that she is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. That she has taken an elevation from property status to making you a complete person. 
Not merely that she is a complete person, but that because of who she is, that the Bible says she too is made in the image and likeness of God, that the two of you together make a complete image of God, that she is to make you a complete person. To be a complement. Not just an accumulation. That is an elevated status. You realize that is Christian doctrine. It is not doctrine anywhere else in the world. From any other culture or religion per se. Uh, there are aspects of it that, that can be inherent to that and grow into it. But these are things that are instructed out of the Bible. That Christian men are to understand that she is a completer to you. But our modern day, and this is a sad to say with the modern ethics uh, that are uh, reactionary toward chauvinism and the, the, nature, the natural nature of man, uh, the world without God has told women, be a computer. Be your own person. Be complete in yourself. You don't need a man. You may want a man, but you don't need a man. You're complete in yourself. And we tell women that they are, 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 are to be insecure, quite frankly, to tap into their insecurities and say, what you need is to always protect yourself, hedge, put away money in case you get a divorce, be ready. And they, 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 they're always on the edge of something falling apart. You, you can't have a real successful marriage. You're not going to have a, a, a real time of being able to give yourself completely to one another. If you're always worried that uh, somehow it's going to end, at some point it's going to end, and you have to have financial protection, you got to get a good lawyer to destroy everybody. Because in a marriage, uh, divorce, you know who wins? The lawyers do. You don't, you don't ever see the lawyers trying to reconcile a couple, do you? Their job is to get in there and drive the wedge so full and so complete that they get paid. That's their financial duty to themselves, and they can justify it a thousand different ways, but that's what they do. Uh, be careful who you marry, because you might be stuck with them for life. <laughs> Amen. I got some pretty good advice from my, my in-laws on marriage. Find somebody, uh, Grandma says, to find somebody you think is just neat. That's a 1950s old-fashioned wisdom. I like that. Find somebody you think is just neat. And of course, my dad's wisdom was a little bit different. He says, you know, find somebody you really like. He says, because they all get fat and ugly and you got to live with them. So find somebody you really like spending time with. <laughs> my wife has not gotten real fat and she hasn't gotten real ugly. She's still pretty good looking. <laughs> but I like her. Most of the time, she's extremely likable, even if I'm not. And she's pretty patient until she's unpatient. <laughs> Somebody's going to cooperate with you. You can't have a marriage where two people are going in different directions, and, and you can't have anything with two heads. If you got a marriage with two heads, you know what you got? Because anything with two heads is a monster. Two heads biting and chomping at each other. Eventually, one head is going to eat the other one off. And <laughs> This marriage is going to dissolve. You have to be able to see your relationship with your husband, your husband, your wife, in the light of God's will for your life. That He has put you together and you have responsibilities to Him and to her. And a lot of time, men, women, when you don't want to submit to each other, because the Bible says submitting to each other in the fear of the Lord. It is our relationship, your personal relationship with God that will cause you to take a deep breath when you're right and she's wrong or he's, you're right and he's wrong that cause you to take a deep breath and God says it doesn't matter who's right or wrong here. I told you, forgive. I told you to let it go. I told you to speak kindly to her. I told you not to tear him down in public. I told you... You know, yeah, you're right, Lord. You're right. I, I, I always stepped in mind. I might have been right in, in my argument with her, but I was wrong in how I, how I treated her, how I spoke about how I dealt with it. That's the kind of thing that happens for people who are submitted first to the relationship with Jesus Christ. Because that's what happens when Christians take the attitude in their marriage, in their lives, in their relationships that John the Baptist did. 
Jesus, he must increase and I must decrease. If you get that right, that he must increase in your mind, in your heart, in the position of authority of your life, that Jesus has more authority over your life than you have in your life. And you really can say, you are Lord and I accept that no matter what. It's amazing how well your marriage will stay together. Because believe me, Jesus is a man. And men, he will tell you. He, he might be gentle. And then he might not be gentle. If you don't listen the first time, he's not afraid to give you a whack on the, on the side of the head. And if that doesn't work, he'll hit you a little harder if he has to. To wake you up. To say, hey, you're not doing right by your wife. And he won't compromise. That's the funny thing. He's a friend who will always tell you the truth, will never compromise and hold you accountable until you get it right. He loves your wife more than you do. And believe it or not, he loves you more than your wife does, but he loves you both very much together. Let's all bow our heads and close our eyes as our time is up this morning. As our pianist and song leader comes, I want you to just take a few moments. And this is a time of reflection in your life. And maybe this morning you, you've seen that maybe, maybe some things in your thinking need to change. And you need to explore this change a little further, a little more deeply. And this morning you would, as a Christian, begin to make some commitments to God. You would, in your heart, pray during this invitation time. In the invitation time, you should never sit here silently, Christian, as you sit the 30, 40 people we have here this morning during the invitation. You should never sit here silently just waiting, Lord. You should be talking to God about whatever God spoke to you about. You should be exploring whatever the Holy Spirit touched you about. In your heart, you should be talking to God. Even if you're not walking to the altar to get saved or, or crying at the altar for, for some great repentance and sin and then looking for renewal and revival and a refilling of the Holy Spirit. Even if that's not where you are, maybe you're sitting there in your chair and the Holy Spirit spoke to you this morning. You say, I, I don't know what to accept or how much to receive of this, this, this radical speech the pastor gave, Lord. But God, I do know I need to explore this more, a little more deeply. I need to get a little more clarity in my own life. And I know that there's some areas in my life need shored up and my thinking needs shored up. And I, I know this can help me if I get a hold of it. And maybe you make that commitment this morning to the Lord, just in your heart, to begin to seek that out in the Scripture, to seek it out in some good Christian literature. To be prayerful about it. To really chew on it. To think about what it means for you. How it will make you a better husband, a better wife. And maybe you're here this morning, you're praying about marriage. And you know that it's, it's God's will for you to marry. But are you sure that you're with the person that God wants for you in your life? If you get some peace about that, you get some clarity, you know that this is what God's will is for your life, that you can go forward in some pretty strong confidence. But if you've got sin in your life, if you've been engaging in premarital relations, and it can cause a great deal of cloudiness in your mind. It can create cloudiness in your conviction. It can, it can, it can, it can cause you to doubt, and it shouldn't. So you get away and have a little bit of a chaste time, a pure time in your life where you get away and you pray before God and, and, and settle some questions in your life. If you've got some insecurities to work out, that during that period of time you, you work it out before God, not merely just in this, this little invitation time we have now, but you would commit yourself to truly a walking away from this invitation and this service and getting away from God and sitting at the beach or on a park bench, a table, uh, somewhere in a picnic area or at the park or perhaps in your room and, and by yourself or in the commute the train, but you would really pray about these things and work through these things in your head. Work through your insecurities and have a good talk with Jesus and tell Him all about it. Tell Him why you feel what you feel and let the Holy Spirit minister to you. Let Him speak to you and work through whatever it is that's holding you back from doing what you believe and know in your heart of hearts God wants you to do and yet you're still afraid. So maybe you're here this morning and you know that at some point you just gotta you gotta take the plunge. But you feel like the water is gonna be too chilly, but once you get in and get used to it, it's pretty nice.
know you got the right one. You know it's God's will. You know this is the person God has put you with. And once you are clear in your heart, he is clear and she is clear in their heart that this is God's will and God's person for your life. I'll be honest, the only thing left to do is plan the wedding and to execute it. But you need to pray through and get that peace. And when you do, you're going to have the confidence to conquer all the challenges that will come your way in life, in marriage. Just It gives challenges. There's lots of hard things. There's no doubt about it. No way to sugarcoat that. Oh, commit your heart to know that this is God's will and you're going to be able to overcome even those difficult challenges. You're going to make it. Oh, Heavenly Father, look at all the people here in this invitation time and the various things that they have to confront and only you and them together can confront it. Help them to be brave. Help them not to walk away and leave it on the table. Oh, we pray that your Holy Spirit will work. Work in this congregation this morning that people might be able to get peace in this area of their lives. And lastly, Father, we pray for anyone here that doesn't know you as personal Lord and Savior, that they themselves have not entered into a genuine personal relationship with you. The kind of relationship that they could point to that moment where they were born again, where they were married to you where they surrender themselves and Lord they say I take you I know you want me you've called me you've been drawing me to yourself and it is at this point I have drawn my line at the altar and I stand here in your presence God and I say yes Lord Jesus wash away my sins come into my heart and life and save me make me your own if there is one here Father that doesn't have a direct point in their life that they can point to and that are sure that today would be the day of salvation, that they would carefully, within their mind's eye, within their heart, stand before your throne and before your spirit and say, yes, Lord, I receive your gift. Give me a new life. I will be yours and you will be mine for the rest of my life. That they might find the peace that passes all understanding that calm assurance that comes with the security of knowing that you are with us and you will never leave us or forsake us. Oh Lord Jesus, move in our midst. Speak to thy people as ever we will.